We are back with uh, Senator Bruce Tarr, the uh, Massachusetts Senate Minority Leader. Senator Tarr, welcome back to MSO. Thanks, Rick. It's great to be back and good afternoon. Thank you, sir. So much going on, and we're going to start it right away with um, <clears throat> species protection, I guess is how we look at it. The uh, protection of the right whales and endangered species has impacted uh, the fishing, in in fishing industry, in particular the lobstering industry. And um, being from Gloucester, I, I think you might have a little uh, insight on that. I, I do, Rick, and it's a very serious situation. Um, so uh, the northern right whale is an endangered species. There are only about 400 of them left, um, and they tend to go up and down the East Coast. And at various times of the year, they're in our waters in Massachusetts. And unfortunately, um, there have been some incidents of entanglement, uh, usually with lobster fishing gear uh, that either injures the whale or winds up being fatal for the whale. And so generally speaking, there are always regulations in place to try to prevent those interactions from happening between lobster gear and the right whale. Um, but what's happening now as a result of uh, a couple of lawsuits in federal court and some actions by the federal government is that Massachusetts is being compelled to increase measures to protect the, the right whale. And those are having a very serious impact on our lobster fishery. And so normally, Rick, if we go to our south um, and we look at the South Shore, we would find that there would be a closure to all lobster fishing, uh, basically from February to May. That closure this year has been moved all the way to the New Hampshire border. And so that's impacting uh, lobster fishers on Cape Ann and in Beverly and all across the North Shore Rockport. And the closure has also been extended to May 15th. So it's increased in, in uh, size and duration. And that is really having an impact on our commercial lobster fishery. And so we're working to try to figure out ways to minimize that going forward, but there has to be a balance. We have to continue to work to protect the right whales because they are endangered, but we also have to protect uh, fishermen and their families who are also endangered. And so as we look to this, um, we're working very hard on Beacon Hill to come up with a set of measures that will help our Division of Marine Fisheries do more research and pilot new gear and find different ways to allow the lobster fishery to continue while protecting the right whale. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So some of the ideas are to try to use uh, rope that will break at a particular tension level so that if a whale becomes entangled, it will be freed by the, the snapping of the rope under pressure. That's something that's had mixed results, but it's something that's being considered. Something else that is a little bit further out in the future is to look at what's called ropeless lobster fishing, which is where the traps uh, do not have a vertical line in the water connected to a buoy. The buoy dwells on the bottom of the ocean and when a vessel approaches, it summons the buoy, it gets released on the bottom, Whoa. rises to the surface, the trap is retrieved, the lobsters are collected, and then it's redeployed to continue fishing. So there are a lot of things that, that are being discussed like that, but they're very expensive. And we're trying to find state resources and, and we'll be working on that in the budget, the state budget for the coming fiscal year to make sure we have the resources to do that. At the same time, however, um, there is a significant threat that if uh, the federal court and the National Marine Fishery Service do not believe that we're doing enough, we could have a shutdown of the entire lobster fishery in Massachusetts. And so this is a very, very serious situation. And I would give credit to the folks at Division of Marine Fisheries. They're working really hard to say, we have this bundle of conservation measures that is adequate and, and more than adequate to be able to protect the right whale, please, let us continue to fish. But it's a very stressful situation right now. And hopefully uh, things will go in the right direction and we will be able to get uh, what is known as an incidental take permit uh, from the federal government, which acknowledges that there might be a, an encounter with a whale, but we're doing everything we need to to prevent that from being lethal. Getting that permit would be a Herculean accomplishment. And right now everybody's working together to try to get to that point. Wow. I love the idea of the new technology. My dad was a lobsterman and um, the idea of uh, the buoys on top, his, his buoys were stolen so many times and traps were pulled. Uh, 
that that sounds like it, but, but, but I understand the cost. And, and Senator, I mean, you, you know a lot of lobstermen personally. I, I do. And we've been hearing from a lot of them, Rick. This is something that um, their colleagues to the South Shore have been dealing with for years, but it, this really has not affected our region until now. And we're hearing from folks and uh, there have been a lot of expressions of uh, opposition and concern uh, to what's happening. And I suspect that we will see more uh, because people are worried that their livelihood is on the line and they rightly are asking us to do everything we can uh, to protect their ability to continue to fish. Well, um, changing the subject here, um, the vaccine rollout I've been getting, I I'm fully vaccinated, but I keep getting the, uh, the, the messages and I'm getting them more and more and more that you can sign up today, today, today. So it seems as though it's rolling along fairly well. And what's the latest update from your perspective? Well, one of the positive things is we are gonna be getting a very significant amount of Johnson & Johnson vaccine doses. Uh, the governor announced that earlier in the week. There was a scare that we might not get them because of something that had happened at one of the production facilities, uh, but we do think we'll get them. And the good news is, Rick, um, and I'm reading uh, off notes here, which I, again, I rarely do, uh, <laughs> but on April 5th, uh, folks who are age 55 and older will become eligible and, and also people with one or more uh, medical conditions. And so, uh, Rick, that includes me. Um, so as of April 5th, I'll be eligible uh, for a vaccine and I'll be registering to get one. And then on April 19th, uh, the uh, floodgates will open and folks that are uh, 16 and older, regardless of anything else, will be eligible. So good progress in terms of eligibility. Um, the websites seem to be working better. Um, and there are also a lot of people on Cape Ann that are working to help other people get vaccines. And they deserve a lot of credit. And we'd like to talk more about that later uh, because we think they deserve special recognition. Uh, but a, a lot of work happening in terms of registration, a lot of work happening in terms of lowering the threshold for eligibility and a lot of things that are very positive happen, happening in terms of getting more doses. And Rick, as we mentioned uh, when the, we last talked, uh, we are putting together a regional application for a, a local vaccine clinic that involves seven communities. And we'll be able to talk a little bit more about that later as well. We're getting the application ready right now. And if we're successful, it means that folks would be able to get vaccinated somewhere on Cape Ann. And we're hoping that that's gonna be able to happen soon. And today the CDC said that if you're fully vaccinated, it's okay to travel within the United States. So it is getting better and better. So thank you for that information. And also you have uh, mentioned that there, um, there's some, uh, uh, some grants coming up for firefighter safety. Yeah, there are. So over the years, um, we've developed a number of different programs to help our firefighters stay safe. And in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, I authored a grant program that helped them with certain uh, kinds of protective clothing. And what we have today is the announcement uh, of a program that's been around for a while has made new grants, the Firefighter Safety Equipment Grants. And these aren't large grants, Rick, but they're very significant for our departments. And so for instance, uh, Essex will be getting uh, $9,657. Gloucester will be getting $15,000 and Manchester by the Sea will be getting $12,500. And these are grants that are used for things to promote firefighter safety, things like communications equipment, or something that's become much more important over the last few years are the machines that wash the firefighters' turnout gear. They're known as extractors. So firefighter turnout gear has been found to be a source of carcinogens. And it's, we are much more enlightened about this now that the gear needs to be washed after every fire incident. And so it's critical that our departments have the machinery to do that. Um, and there are things even like flashlights and thermal imagers and other kinds of things, all eligible through these grants. And again, not a lot of money, but the amounts that are here do make a big difference in keeping people safe who keep us safe. Most excellent. And finally, Senator, it's uh, Easter weekend. And I know that you um, and a colleague and, and of yours, uh, you're doing something that you really enjoy doing. I know you don't sleep. You don't go to bed at night. You're continuously working. So this is one of the things that you, you do for fun, I guess. Well, you know, one of, one of the great things that we're able to do is, is go out and do some outreach um, to people in the community. And this afternoon, uh, before we are doing this interview, Rick, 
Um, Representative Brad Hill and I were in Ipswich working with the Ipswich Council on Aging um, and ACORN um, to be able to provide uh, some food packages um, to our seniors. And Representative Hill and I were going to people's homes uh, with food uh, meals that were prepared by Henry's in Beverly uh, that we paid for and had the chance to go out and distribute. And that was, it's just a wonderful experience to be able to see people and say hello, uh, particularly seniors, you know, who've been more isolated in many cases than the rest of us. And it's been wonderful. And I'm pleased to tell you, Rick, that on uh, Sunday, I will be doing that again uh, through the auspices of the American Legion, Lester S. Wasp Post 3 in Gloucester, uh, Commander Mark Nestor has summoned me again to the Legion um, to help with holiday meals. They used to be prepared at the Legion. Um, now they're prepared um, and distributed from the Open Door Food Pantry on Emerson Avenue. And Rick, the last couple of times that I've been involved with this, um, the organization has been producing approximately 700 meals, a little bit short of that, um, that get put together, assembled at the Open Door, and then drivers are standing by and take those meals out into the community. And one of the great things is um, our sea cadets have been working to help, they, they volunteer. And there's a very strong volunteer corps, many of whom are veterans that are working to help other veterans and folks that uh, deserve to have a special holiday meal. And so for me, um, it is a highlight to be able to do that and to be able to get out and see people and to be able to provide uh, some food, but as importantly as the food is a message that you're part of our community and we care about you and we want to bring you this, uh, this token of, um, of our respect for you and, and our thoughts for you with a, a holiday meal. And Senator, the volunteers you mentioned, including yourself, there's no remuneration for this. This isn't something you do for glory and this isn't something you do for votes. I know you personally do this because it's something that you want to do. And I, I applaud you and thank you for that. I think uh, if, if more people uh, in, in your um, your colleagues example, uh, both statewide and nationally, if they did that in terms of service, it'd be a better country. So thank you very much, Senator. Well, thanks, Rick. I, I have to tell you, I get back far more than I give in this case. And it doesn't come in, in as you mentioned, in terms of fame or, or uh, material gain, it comes in satisfaction of being able to help folks and being able to feel connected in a different way uh, to our community. It's a wonderful thing, a wonderful feeling. And again, congratulations and thanks to the Ipswich Council on Aging and to American uh, Legion Post 3 and to the open door uh, where the meals are, are cooked and prepared for us to be able to put them in packaging and distribute them on uh, Easter Sunday.